So we have uh, all these elements. And what I want to do is I want to uh, play the interview for you. And then we're going to talk about uh, how we're going to cut it in the interface. So I'm going to hit the tilde key. So here everything is small in the corner. If I want to step up, this will take me back into the higher level where I can see my folders. If I want, I can look at them as a list. There's the interviews. We'll look at uh, the master shot. And I just want you to sit back and watch this to see what we're working with. So I want to bring this full screen again. So I'm going to hit the tilde. And we're just going to play this from the beginning. You'll get to see me do a, a marker thing. And then we're going to start working with this footage. Crap in my pockets. <laughs> Watch first five minutes. All right, we're at speed. So if you want to give us a nice loud clap. There's our sync clap for syncing up all of our camera and our audio. So Mike, welcome. Thank you. Um, I've seen a lot of your work, real pretty stuff. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your photography, what got you into photography? Like a lot of photographers, I started when I was real young. Uh, I think I was 12 years old. My dad bought me an Argus C3, an old film camera. It's great, it was all manual. Uh, he even gave me a Sekonic light meter. I remember walking around my, uh, my little town and had my light meter and my Argus, and it was just fascinating to me. And then, you know, getting the film back, um, it was just such a great learning process. Uh, you know, with the old Argus, you had to cock, you had to cock it separately than, than advance the film. So I got lots of double exposures. And, and I remember making that mistake, but also remembering how creative that could be. So when I was real young, in, it was into photography. As the years progressed, uh, I just continued to enjoy it as a hobby, love photography. And then I resigned from my corporate job a few years back, uh, actually about 12 years ago now, and decided to go into photography full-time. So I've been a full-time photographer since around the year 2004. And it's changed a lot now with digital. It's a whole, a whole new game. Oh, yeah. I started with film, and I have, I have uh, slide cabinets full of uh, slides. And I've got them all databased, and I've got them all archived, ready to go. But once digital came, I remember the day I got a, a Nikon. It was a Nikon uh, digital camera. And I started taking my photos with that camera. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm never going back to film. And that was the early days of you know, Photoshop and, and digital processing and raw photos. But what a difference it's made. Was it that Nikon that twisted? I'm trying to think of what that model was. That, yeah, what was that I one? Had that, I mean, you'd go through batteries like crazy. Like, like 16 shots is like new batteries. Yes, yeah. So I had one of those, and then my first Nikon DSLR. That was the, the day I bought that camera was the last day I shot film. I haven't shot a film picture since then. I, I, I know the feeling. <laughs> I know the feeling. Do you find that old skill, though, that, you know, shooting manual, needing to know a light meter, has that helped with working in the digital world? Oh, yeah, tremendously. I mean, there's no excuse for not understanding exposure and everything around ISO, aperture, shutter speed, all of that still applies. You know, you need a fast shutter speed to freeze the motion, long shutter speed to get motion blur. You know, all of that still applies and I use it every single day in my business. Well, aside from business, you do a lot of travel photography. Actually, you take people out on, on tours. Yeah, Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so travel photography, I've always loved travel. In fact, I remember when I was young, my wife and I made a pact that we would travel internationally every single year of our life, and so we've always tried to, to do that. But um, travel photography, for me, it is a business. Uh, I take people on trips around the world. Uh, I just came back from Galapagos a couple weeks ago, and the whole purpose of these trips is taking photographers to these places in the hopes of getting uh, great photographs. And so I'm the photo guide, I'm the photo instructor, uh, and, but I've set up really great itineraries for, for photography. So, you know, Galapagos, Tanzania, Iceland, and other places around the world. We'll be going to Cuba here in, in a few months as well. Really very, looking very forward exciting. To it. Yeah, Cuba is uh, one of those places that everybody wants to get to before it changes too much. I know. It's a, yeah, it's going to change fast, and, and it already is. Now, what are some of the unique challenges you've had when you've been on the road with photographers? 
Well, you got the personalities. You know, photographers like to think we know a lot of stuff, and so there's a lot of personality sometimes that comes with traveling with other photographers. Um, but you know, I deal with that with humor and <laughs> just a good general disposition. But um, anymore, I think the biggest challenges now uh, with photographers is there are so many photographers in the world, and a lot of us think like we have priority or we should have priority access to places and so now I go to places like Iceland and photographers are everywhere just everywhere and so I think that's an issue it's an issue with the local law enforcement it's an issue with just you know trying to find unique shots it's harder to find a unique shot today than it was 10 15 20 years ago so it just means we have to work harder creatively now I know you do a lot of large-scale images a lot of now, I'm gonna stop it at this point because there's a whole nother chunk of the interview but my goal here was for me, listen for key things that I want to tell the story and also see, well, what's superfluous? And for you all to have a better understanding of what we're working with. So what you would do is if you're working with an interview, you could write notes and say, oh, I really like this sound bite. And I want to show you a couple things in the interface. On the lower left-hand corner is basically where you are in the clip. Uh, for most cameras that you're working with, it'll probably start at zero and go through whatever the duration of the clip is. And you'll see it as four digits, uh, hours, seconds, minutes, frames of video, okay? So you'll see that there's, there's four numbers down there. And so you could do a paper edit and write down, oh, I like this sound bite. As a matter of fact, you don't even need to be in some editing programs. Sometimes just watching these, you can uh, find the duration in just quick time or whatever you're watching it with. So that's something to keep in mind, so you can write notes. Uh, you can also start marking it. And on the right side, let's pan over to the right side, there we go, is another set of numbers. That's the total duration of the clip. Okay, keep that in mind. Because this will be useful because once you start selecting parts of a clip where you mark an in and an out point, that number will change as that's how much time is between the beginning and the end of the section that you want. So there's two very valuable numbers uh, for you to reference. Now the computer remembers all this. So you don't necessarily always have to, but this is something that will be very useful as you go down the line. So let's go ahead. I have, uh, I want to start laying down and creating uh, the interview. So I have the, the four cuts and I want to basically work with these four images. So I'm going to step into that folder. I'm going to step into the bin. You'll see them referred to as bins inside uh, the video applications. This is kind of a standard. It comes from the old film days when literally strips of film would hang over big canvas bins and they needed a shot, they'd pull it down. Well, we still use the term bins, and so I'm going to step inside. If you double click, and I don't want you to double click, if you double click, the end result is you get this ugly floating box that just blocks your interface. So you want to step into it, and so if you hold down the command key, on a Mac, control key on Windows, and I click, it lets me step into this without cluttering my interface so you don't have these things. So that's a very useful tool, uh, holding down the command key. Uh, there is another option. You can also, I'm gonna step back up. If I hold down the option or the alt key when I do that, I want you to see what happens here. I'm gonna bring this full screen. So I have all these tabs, but if I hold down the option key and I double click, it opens this up as its own discrete tab. Very useful tool for organizing. I'm moving that tab over to the left. So now I have a tab here with just my interview clips, and I'm gonna look at that in an icon view, make it bigger. And I have a tab here that has the list of all my footage. So I can very easily jump back and forth if I wanna be able to dig and find something without having to like hunt and dial up and dial down. Very easy to do. Let's go ahead and uh, decide what we want. We want, first thing we need to do is we need to make a sequence. We need to make, you know, basically the template to drop all our stuff into. It will do that automatically if you drag a clip into it. If I drag any clip into this, it will automatically create a sequence, name the sequence after the clip, and have all the parameters match that clip. That's great if all your footage is the same size, same source, but, Sometimes you might choose something at a lower resolution, like 1280, you know, uh, 720p it would be called. Or sometimes it's 1080p, all these different terms that we talked about in the first day. Um, sometimes it might be ultra high definition, and you don't want a big ultra high definition 4,000 pixel image when everything else is gonna be smaller. So you wanna generate, for most of the time, you're a new sequence from scratch. I'm gonna undo this, 
Command Z, Control Z, same undo functions that you would use in almost every program. And under File, I'm going to go New, and I'm going to say New Sequence. And gracefully try to do that. There we go, New Sequence. And by the way, if you make a new, se a new document in, say, Word, what's the keyboard shortcut? Command N, Control N, same thing if you want to do it quickly. A lot of these are very intuitive keyboard shortcuts. It's going to give you this crazy, confusing dialog box that says, and this, I'm sure if you've ever opened this up and looked at it, it says, ah. These are all these different flavors. They're broadcast stuff. No idea. Don't worry about it. You're probably going to use, most of the time, digital SLR, 1080p, that's standard high definition. OK, that's 1920 by 1080 pixels, 30 frames a second as your default. Sometimes you might record things, films are 24, people say the film look, the film look is a lot more than shooting it at 24 frames a second. But general video that we've been seeing for years is 30 images every second in an aspect ratio of widescreen of 1920 by 1080. If you choose that, the odds are that everything's going to work very smoothly for you. That's what you're going to want to use initially until you get some unique client that says, oh, it has to be square or something. Not going to go into that. We're going to create a new sequence. And all the key thing is naming it. Otherwise, you have all your sequences named sequence. So let me zoom out a little bit. So all I did was I selected digital SLR. As a matter of fact, the next time I create a new sequence, it's going to remember that was my last one. It'll always go back to that. And then I'm going to give it a name. Name's going to be uh, interview. MH for Mike Hagan. And not worry about anything else, go with the defaults. It gets put inside the project file. It's not stored in another part of your computer. It's actually in the project. You'll see it's created here. And now I have this timeline. And now when I go ahead, if I bring a clip in, and let's go ahead and start the interview. And we're going to actually mark some things and look at the interface. So we, all I did is I wanted to bring this first clip in. To bring a clip in from down here, I'll make this a little smaller so you can see this, is I can do, again, many things. I can double click, loads it into this source viewer. I can drag it, loads it into the source viewer. You can even right click, and there's a, the option to open in source monitor. Okay? All ways to get it in. So I can see the clips. I want to start with my master shot. I'm going to double click on it, and now we're going to work on picking the part of the shot we want and bringing it into our show. And so. I talked about transport controls earlier in the lesson. So these are the little buttons here. Instead of making this big, I'm going to zoom in because that way the buttons will be easier to see. So if I wanted to, I could hit play. Find unique shots. It's and as I'm playing, you see this playhead moves. This is basically, if this was a VCR or something, where the tape head hit the, the tape. Okay? That's the frame or the, or the frame of film I'm looking at, okay? the one image. So I can scrub through it by dragging it very quick. Space bars play. Like crazy. Like, like 16 shots. And so what I want to do is I want to be able to go through this quickly. Now, you can hit play. You can hit these uh, little fast forward buttons down here. But I'm going to have you use some basic keyboard shortcuts to start with. So, so if like, it was playing, yeah. yes. you know, yeah. there so I could I go forward to frame. I could fast forward. SLR. What I want you to do is. Oh, you can use your right hand. Advanced let editors use the left hand. South by use the left hand. Everybody argues about that. OK. On the keyboard, there are three keys, J, K, and L. J, if I press it, will play backwards. OK. K will pause. L will play forwards. OK. And my thumb is also a, a nice thing for the space bar. So if I hit the J key, it plays backwards. If I hit the L key, it plays forwards. K will stop it. Now. That's nice, but let's leverage the power of this. If I want to fast forward, I could tap the L key a couple of times. Yes, yeah. So I had one of those, and then my first Nikon DSLR. That was the day I bought that camera. It was so I'm hearing it at kind of a high speed. Since then. If I tap it again, it's even faster, up to I think 32 or 64 times normal speed. So that's L, just multiple taps. If I do J, it does the same thing in reverse. Very quick way. And by the way, these controls work whether you're looking at it in the source monitor, whether you're looking at media in the media browser, in the project panel, or even in your timeline. JKL, you use it all the time. It also allows you to do some very precise skimming of your media. So if I hold down the K key, 
and tap L, okay, that would be forward, I move forward one frame at a time. Very precise. If you notice in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you can see that 26, 27, 28, 29, zero, okay? That's 30 frames a second. I can do the same thing in reverse, K and J, going backwards. I can also scrub in slow motion by just holding down the K in combination with either the J or the L. So K and L, Freeze slow motion, motion, one fourth speed. Okay, it gives you some very precise. So this is important. This is navigation you'll constantly use, and you can go through this. I also want to point out we can hear the audio. We can see the video, but we can't see the audio. Sometimes it's nice to cut if you could see what's an audio waveform. And you can easily switch between seeing the video and seeing audio by these little icons. One looks like a piece of film. One looks like an audio waveform. And so if I go over here, I can now see my audio waveforms. Shutter speed to get motion. So you can see exactly where a person speaks. OK, so that's a little idea of how you navigate through this. How many people think that's pretty hard to see exactly where the person's changing their, their word? Exactly, it is. It's very hard to see. That's because we're looking at everything. We're looking at the whole 10 minutes. So if I want to zoom in, I can use the plus and the minus keys on my keyboard. That plus is the equal key. Some people give me a hard time about that. But the, the equal key and the minus key, but where the plus is, lets me zoom in down to the sample level, literally. And I can see this in great detail. So minus brings me back. Plus brings me in. And if I zoom in and move something over here, when I jump back to video, it matches. So that's how you start navigating through the clip and picking the section you want. Now, the thing is, when doing a rough cut, you don't have to be super precise. You can leave things a little bit fat, OK? You can have some handles on it. Because when you go in and do your fine cut, that's where you can trim out that extra breath or that extra word. OK, you have the same control once it's in your sequence. And you just want to kind of get the feel of this, the flow of this, and develop a rhythm. So what we need to do is we need to mark in and out points. So I'm going to go back here. And I'm going to just eyeball this. I, hit the, I slap my hands together to sync my cameras if we want to do that later. We'll look at that. So mic. So I go mic. So I'm going to start this here. I'm yeah. using the J and the K together. And now I want to mark an in point. There are buttons to mark your in and out points, OK, where I want this clip to start. OK, it's a little left and right bracket. Don't use those. You can, but don't. Because your fingers are already on J, K, and L, right? Well, luckily, 115 years ago, when they invented the QWERTY keyboard for a typewriter, they put the I and the O key, which stands for in and out, right above J, K, and L. And so without even moving my hand, I can find the spot. I'm going to hit the I key, which is right above J and K. And you see, I have now marked the in point of where I want this clip to start. Okay? And it's going to run all the way to the end unless I mark an out point. So take a note. There's the time on the show. This is the duration of the clip. That's going to change as soon as I find an out point. So Mike, welcome. Thank you. Um, I've seen a lot of your work, real pretty stuff. I've seen a lot of your work, real pretty stuff is what I just said. I'm going to mark an out point. Watch what happens. Boom. This is five seconds. That's a good length for a shot. We'll talk a little bit later on about rhythm and whatnot. So there it is. There's my in to my out point, ready to bring this into my timeline. So I marked my in and out point. And you can use keyboard shortcuts, but we're going to drag initially. And I'm going to just drag this clip down to my timeline and just drop it right at the left edge. Be careful. If you let go here, it will land there. And the first couple minutes of your show, will be nothing. Okay? If you do that, you can always grab it and move it to the left to the wall. Now, that's kind of hard to see. I don't see a lot of detail. I'm pretty zoomed out in my timeline. We use the plus and minus before to zoom into our audio waveform. Same keyboard shortcuts. Let me zoom in to my timeline. Now, I'm zooming in. The problem is it's at the very beginning, so I'd have to scroll to see what it is. But there you can see I zoom in, and there's my clip. And if I wanted to play it, I select the timeline and hit the space Hi. bar. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I've seen a lot of your work, real pretty stuff. OK, seen a lot of your work, real pretty stuff. Welcome. We have the first clip Thank in my timeline. Timeline is going to be the order. Uh, I talked a little bit about this. I want to zoom in just so you have a, an understanding of the tracks. We looked at this earlier. So we bring things in. There's our video. There's our audio. OK, if it's. Uh, Depending on how it was recorded, and we'll look at this in audio, it could be a single mic. It could be both mics. 
if you have like a stereo camera mic on the, on the camera. All fits into that one track of audio. That's, the, that, that's that sound that goes with that video. If I want, if I was going to put a title on, I might put it on the track above with a transparency channel. Okay, name, graphic, whatever. And we start building things up. If I wanted to do a cutaway of his photos, I could put it above because you don't see what's below. Okay? So we'll, we'll look at that, that compositing. Um, we'll actually do a whole chunk on that when we look at uh, motion and animation and graphics. Yes? So to get just that clip into the timeline, you, dr you dragged it from the source window into the timeline, not from the bin into not the Not from the bin. OK. So the question was, I dragged it from the source into the timeline. Remember that horrible thing I said earlier that there's five ways to do everything? I could have dragged it from the bin. Um, I could also use a keyboard shortcut. And that's, that's why it's a great question. Um, because depending on your workflow and what you're doing, you might be able to do things in the bin. As a matter of fact, the next one, I'm going to try to drag in from the bin. And I'm going to show you uh, the benefits and the downsides of that. Uh, and then eventually, I start using keyboard shortcuts because it's faster because my hands are already on the keys. And guess what? My putting it on the keyboard shortcut is right below that JKL. So I don't even have to, I mean, your hand's going to get tired from just not moving. So we laid that in. Um, I can zoom in. If I want to play in the timeline, JKL, yeah. oh. spacebar, all works the same. And what you see here, now in this right window, is you see the visual, what the viewer sees, and this is the graphical representation down on the timeline, audio waveform. Which, by the way, you can make bigger and smaller if you can't see this well. Uh, if you hold down Command and Plus, or Control and Plus on Windows, you can make it bigger. Now see a little icon of that. And then if you hold down Option or Alt, you can make your audio bigger and see your waveforms. Very useful. Very useful ways to navigate. Um, you can also just drag. If you put your mouse in there, you can use a scroll wheel. I can make this manually bigger if I want. And we'll look at some more timeline navigation throughout the course. But now let's just get some more clips into, our, into play. So we have our first clip. I want to see the whole clip, so I could hit the minus key. Now I see my space. And if I wanted to cut to me, now I can, in here, mar double click. I'm going to pick up where I start talking again. Cut to a close up of me. They even gave me a Sikonic light meter. There's our sync. I'm using JKL. All of our camera and our audio. So, Mike, welcome. Thank you. Um, I see a lot of work, real pretty stuff. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your photography. What got you into photography? So what got you into photography? A lot of your work, real pretty stuff. Mark an endpoint with the I key. Found the, the endpoint, I'm going to hit play again. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your photography, what got you into photography? Like a lot Marked of- Mark an out point, in and out. You see it's down there. If I need to zoom in on this a little bit, OK? I'm using the same plus and minus keys. It's not zooming my image, it's just letting me look tighter on the timeline. Instead of having to see it like this, I'm just looking at that small chunk. Easier to navigate, easier for you to see. Plus and minus, it's easy. Just remember that. Okay? And so I'm going to now mark an out point, uh, the O key, right above. Now I have that clip. So I marked it here. Because I marked it here, it should also be marked in my bins. So I could grab it in, and you notice if I just drag it across. So you could go through and mark a lot of in and out points and bring it in. Remember, if I let go here, it lands there. I want it next to it so I don't have a flash frame. By default, it will snap like magnets to the previous clip. If that doesn't happen, you've turned off something called snapping. Guess what the keyboard shortcut for snapping is? S. So I just hit the S key, and it turned off snapping. And now I could, it doesn't lock in. And I could actually write it over. There are times when you want, I hit the S key to turn it back on again, by the way. And just so you can see visually, remember I said it's like a magnet? On, off. OK? So if you see that it's not snapping, uh, you can turn it on. Sometimes when you're working with audio, you don't want it to snap to the wall. So you'll turn it off. But most of the time for video, you want it to snap so you have those spaces. Yes? So I notice now you've basically pulled two clips, two in and out points that are totally adjacent to one another in your original video. Why would you do that? Well, in this case, I'm switching cameras. So I want this for visual variety. So a lot of times, 
we just want to change things up. Now, the whole point of editing is, A, to keep your audience interested, and for them not to see the edit. Ideally, you don't want them to feel the editing. You want them to enjoy your show. So it's just visual variety. If, if I was talking to the crowd, to the whole audience, I would go like, hello. But then if you asked a question, I would look at you. I would be now a close-up. You would be a close-up to me. So we're trying to recreate that. And that's why we would cut there. And you know, the wide shot's not as interesting. We want to see, uh, introduce the two of us to establish the shot, now introduce the person doing the interview, and then we're going to cut to Mike. Now, I may eventually trim out part of my question. And I also will probably trim out part of his answer. I'm not going to use the whole interview. I'm going to use selected chunks to tell a specific story. Actually, I'm very interested in his travel adventures, and I have footage for that. So I'll probably cut out a whole chunk about you know, his early camera time, and then I didn't even play for you when we talked about Panorama, because I want to tell a specific story. And when I was watching the, the video, I was saying, OK, this is a really good little sound bite, and I have video to cover it. This is a good sound bite to have video to cover it. It's like, he repeats himself here, so I know I want to remove it. And that's what we're trying to do with this initial rough cut, is just bring things in and start to tell that story. Okay? These are called, they can be called either insert or overwrite edits. At, at this point, I'm just dragging it in. It's placing it next to each other. But I'm going to go ahead and, and show you just a, a couple of other ways that you can bring this in. Again, I'm throwing a lot of keyboard shortcuts at you. You don't have to memorize them all. There'll be a shortcut sheet. I'm going to show you where you can even find it from um, Adobe. But remember that plus and minus? Well, if, if I use shift plus and minus, it actually lets me toggle. Shift plus, I get to see everything bigger. Shift minus, smaller. This is just a nice, quick shortcut to say, I want to see more detail. I want to see less detail. Works for all, all the lines. So I just brought that down so you could see it better. Um, we're going to get a mic talking. Again, to load it in, double click. And we're going to do this quickly because we'll clean it up later. Uh, uh, your photography, what got you into photography? Like a lot of Mark photographers, I started when I was really young. Uh, I think I was 12 years old. My dad bought me an Argus C3, an old film camera. It's great. It's all manual. Uh, he even gave me a Siconic light meter. I remember walking around my, uh, my little town and had my light meter. And so that's kind of nice, had my light meter. I want to bring this in and I want to start using, really controlling this without always having to drag it down. So. <laughs> If I have the playhead part and I hit one of these buttons here, insert or overwrite, we're going to use the uh, overwrite button now. Insert, it doesn't matter because there's no other video there. The keyboard shortcuts for those are comma and period. Okay, overwrite's a period key, it's right below JKL. So if I hit the period key right now, it looks like we lost what we did. We just need to zoom out on our timeline. Um, minus key would do that. If you want to quickly zoom out in your timeline, the backslash key. Okay. If you hit the backslash key, it shows you your whole timeline all at once. If you hit it again, it goes back to the same view you had before. So those are very used. Backslash I use a lot. Okay. It's right underneath the delete key, above the return key. Okay. So I see this whole thing. It put the clip where that playhead was parked. It had to know where do I want to put it. Since I didn't drag it, it put it where my playhead was parked. Okay. So I'm going to hit undo. And this is an important concept to, to get. If I hit undo and I move the playhead now to the beginning or the end of the clip, and I can do that very easily. Um, I could drag it, but unless you turn on a preference that says snap the playhead to the end of the clip, it won't snap to it. I'll show you how to do that in the next lesson. For now, the up and down arrow key jumps you between edit points. Very, very useful. So if I hit the up key, I go backwards to my edit points. Down key, I go forwards. So now I know exactly where I want to be. Now if I go ahead and I hit that period key, it puts the clip exactly where I want. Okay? So the playhead is the default of where your clip's going to go in. Now that I've made that rule, it's time to break that rule. Because we've learned marking in and out points, I'm going to hit undo. So if I, mark, if I move my playhead here and I mark an in point, the in point, play cards, so I was, was going to call it spades, but it's a bridge. You have a trump card, right? It beats everything. So that takes the place of where the playhead is. So I've marked an in point. We can see it's right there. I don't care where this is. As soon as I hit that button to overwrite the period key or this, it puts it where the endpoint is. So an endpoint supersedes the playhead. Okay? 
So just something to mark. So a lot of times you'll, you know, the playhead usually jumps to the end of the clip as you put it in. So if I'm editing quickly, it works very nicely. I'm going to hit undo. I'm going to bring this in. I'm going to remove my, uh, my endpoint. So I and O is in and out. There's an optional way to remove it. Take a guess what the optional way to remove an in and out point is. An optional way to remove the in and out point. Maybe it's an alternate way if you're on Windows. Option I, I'm not, yeah. Option I, option O removes the in and the out. So if I want to do that, option I, in point's gone. So now I don't have to worry about it. Move my playhead to the beginning. Clip is selected. Bring it in. You'll notice the playhead now comes to the very end, ready for the next one to come in. So I don't have to keep worrying about it. So if I don't want to go in and mark ins and ins and ins, I'm just slugging a bunch of clips in for an interview, that is a, uh, a great way to do it. 